Please be seated. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, welcome to the inauguration of Carl J. Strickwerda as 14th President of Elizabethtown College. Welcome to Carl, his wife Gail, Basenga and his daughter, Lorna. Welcome to our platform guests, fellow trustees, honored delegates from learned societies and institutions of higher education. Welcome to our college community of valued faculty, students, administrators, staff, alumni, and special guests. And welcome to all who have taken time out of their busy lives to join us on this special 
and momentous occasion. It is not surprising that we needed to move indoors today. Since Carl has joined us, we have had an earthquake. <laughs> we've had a hurricane. We've had floods. And some enterprising students at my house on a reception last week found some locusts in the trees. <laughs> it seems like just yesterday we were beginning the search for a new president. In fact, it has been 18 months. The collective efforts of many individuals enables us to officially welcome and honor Carl J. Strickwerda as our president. From the initial interviews, it was apparent to the board that Carl was the clear choice. It also became apparent to the pres presidential search committee that Carl not only had the academic credentials in research and academic discipline, but also in leadership and commitment to the values and the mission of Elizabethtown College. There were three groups directly involved in the search, transition, and celebration that have influenced the presidential leadership at the college. I would like to publicly recognize the Presidential Search Committee, the Presidential Transition Team, and the Inaugural Celebration Committee for their collaboration in making this day a reality. Sir Isaac Newton has said, if I have seen father, farther, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. This afternoon, I would like to recognize three of our most recent giants. First of all, Dave Hosler, who provided the leadership of the Board of Trustees for the past eight years. And when I think of David, I think of the creative insight that he brought to this institution and to the Board. Secondly, I think of Dr. Betty Long for what she brought as the matriarch of this organization over the last 15 years. And finally, for Dr. Ted Long, whose leadership, whose vision has transformed the institution. And for all of you that have just come back and have not visited our uh, campus, you can see the change that he has brought to us. May you all congratulate and recognize these three individuals for the significant contributions they've made to this organization. Since August the 1st, Carl has implemented a strategic planning process met with over 40 key stakeholders throughout the eastern United States, and he and Gail have attended nearly 20 regional events. He has met students on campus and introduced Tuesdays with Carl, where he spends one Tuesday a month lunching with students and listening to their ideas for the college. Listening is one of Carl's greatest gifts, a gift that will serve him and our college well as we prepare our students to be a bigger part of the world. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the niece of Carl J. Stricorda, Jessica Bratt, who is chaplain of Children's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts, for our invocation. Thank you.
Please rise as you are able and let us join our hearts in prayer. Holy God, source of wisdom and light, be present among us today. Gather us in and unite us in a spirit of humble gratitude as we mark this occasion. God of every generation, we give thanks that your servant Carl has accepted the call to lead this institution. And we ask that you guide and sustain him in all the tasks that lie ahead. Grant strength and joy to Carl and to Gail and to all those who study, teach, perform, and serve on this campus. May this continue to be a place where gifts are discovered and talents are cultivated, where relationships are born and character is forged, where understanding deepens and creativity thrives. This day and every day, renew in all of us a commitment to seek justice and peace throughout our communities, this nation, and across the globe. Fill us with diligence, courage, and compassion. God of new beginnings, as we celebrate this new chapter for Carl and for the college, we seek your blessing upon our intentions and endeavors. Lead us, O oh God, to live further into the beauty, purpose, and wholeness that you desire for humanity and for all creation. Now nourish our minds and spirits in what we hear, say, and do today. All this we ask with grateful hearts. Amen. You may be seated. On behalf of the Elizabethtown College Alumni Association and the Alumni Council, its governing body, welcome. I am Joe Denlinger, class of 1991, and president of the Elizabethtown College Alumni Association and the Alumni Council. In my capacity as president, I bring greetings from the more than 17,000 members of the Alumni Association located throughout the world. During the past weeks, Carl has met with the executive leadership of the Alumni Council as well as more than 200 alumni and friends from the Harrisburg and Lancaster regions. His travels will continue in the upcoming months as he will meet with hundreds more alumni from our other alumni chapters throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. At each of these events, Carl will be received with the same enthusiasm with which he is being greeted today. The Alumni Council, along with all Elizabethtown College alumni, are extremely excited by the prospect of Carl's leadership of the college and are looking forward to working with him in the many years to come. To Carl and Gail, we warmly welcome you now into the greater Elizabethtown College community and are proud to consider you Blue Jays always. As president of the faculty assembly, I extend a gracious welcome from the members of the, of the faculty of the college. I represent 130 committed teacher scholars that are dedicated to providing students with a rigorous academic program that blends liberal arts and professional studies. We look forward to working with Carl, or President Strict Verda uh, as, he, as he builds a learning community founded on academic excellence, service to others, and global understanding. On behalf of the professional staff of Elizabethtown College, I bring you sincere greetings. I am proud to represent the dedicated and talented staff of 190 individuals who, who who support student learning and strengthen the college. As members of the campus community, we lift up the college values of peacemaking, human dignity, and social justice. Considering the diversity of our roles at Elizabethtown, we recognize students are at the center of all our good work. We are committed to advancing the college and enhancing the Elizabethtown experience so that every student is well prepared for challenges and opportunities, both during and beyond college. 
Dr. Strickwerda, we look forward to partnering with you toward the common goal of excellence in all that we do for the college and for our students. Thank you. I, along with more than 220 hourly staff members of the college, extend a welcome to you. After more than 15 years with the college, I can say that my longevity is not unusual. I and others on the staff are here because we believe in the mission of the college. Most importantly, we are here for our students. They enrich our lives in many ways none of us could imagine. In my role, I see these students two or three times a day, and I can say that I love each and every one of them. We are not decision makers of the college, but rather we are the ones who make the decisions happy, um, excuse me, happen. We will, <laughs> we will support you as you move the college forward. Although I am retiring later on this year, I know that each of the staff members I represent is committed to supporting you and will represent our college well. It is my honor as the President of Student Senate to welcome Dr. Strickwerda to Elizabethtown College. As students, we hail from 35 different states and six countries. Many students describe our college community as a home away from home or a member of the new family. We are glad that you have joined our E-Town family and appreciate your desire to engage with the students on a personal level. This is important to us, and as students, we have already taken notice. On behalf of the entire student body of Elizabethtown College, we look forward to developing a strong personal and professional relationship with you as we work together to build a bright future for this special place we call home. It's my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. Nicholas P. Walterstorff is a distinguished philosopher and scholar and is the NOAA P. 
Porter Professor Emeritus of Philosophical Theology at Yale University. He is a graduate of Calvin College and earned his PhD in philosophy at Harvard University. From 1989 until his retirement in 2001, Dr. Wolfterstorff was on the faculty at Yale, teaching at the Divinity School and in the philosophy and religious studies departments. Before his appointment at Yale, he taught at Calvin College, where he knew and inspired a young, perhaps I should say younger, Carl Strickwerda. <laughs> Dr. Walter Stoff has written 16 books and authored over 150 articles in professional journals. Far ranging in his interests, he has made scholarly contributions in the fields of metaphysics, aesthetics, philosophy of art, philosophy of religion, and political philosophy. His publications in each of these fields are numerous and substantial, and his co-authored monograph, Faith and Rationality, published in 1984, is considered the seminal work in Reformed theology. In addition to his scholarly publications, Dr. Walterstorff is the author of a popular acclaimed personal reflection, Lament for a Son, an account of his experience grieving the loss of his 25-year-old son, Eric, in a mountain climbing accident. Lament for a Son is a deeply moving exploration of faith in the face of tremendous sadness and grief. This book, like his scholarly publications, have had an, has had an enduring influence. Dr. Walter Stoff has been the president of the American Philosophical Association and of the Society of Christian Philosophers. He is a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Among the named lectures he has given are the Wild Lectures at Oxford University, the Gifford Lectures at St. Andrews University, the Stone Lectures at Princeton Sem Seminary, and the Taylor Lectures at Yale. It is an honor to have Dr. Walter Storff with us on the occasion of this inauguration. The title of his speech is, What is College for Anyway? Please join me in welcoming Dr. Walter Storff. Thank you for that welcome. Um, let me begin by saying this is a handsome space, a beautiful space, don't you think? Excuse me. Let me begin by congratulating my friend Carl Strickwitter on the honor of being chosen as the, oh, I should have opened with an address, students of Elizabethtown College, uh, faculty, staff, um, board of trustees, supporters and friends of the college, friends and relatives of the Strickwardas. That's a proper beginning, okay. <laughs> <laughs> After that beginning, let me um, begin by congratulating my friend Carl Strickwarda on the honor of being chosen as the 14th president of this fine college and also congratulate Elizabethtown College on the wisdom of having chosen this fine person, scholar, and administrator, Carl Strickwitta, as your 14th president. And let me also express the pleasure and honor I feel at being invited to give this talk. Thanks, Carl. An occasion such as this calls for reflection on the fundamental question. What's a college for anyway? Or more precisely, what is this college for? Elizabethtown College. A liberal arts college in the tradition of Church of the Brethren for whom service is a major commitment. <laughs> I tell you nothing you don't already know when I say that we live in troubled and turbulent times. The United States is in a deep and stubborn recession the worst since the Great Depression of the 1930s, with unemployment hovering around 9%. On September 13, it was reported that the number of Americans living in poverty has hit, for us, a record high of 46.2 million people. Contributing to our difficulties, as you know, is the fact that given economic globalization, the debt of a small country like Greece 
threatens the financial institutions and economy, not only of the rest of Europe, but of the world. One of the results of radical changes in communication technology is that the most rabid and wacky opinions now get wide circulation. Previously, it was the educated elite who pretty much controlled most of the sources of information and opinion. That is obviously no longer the case. And not unrelated to those changes in communication technology is the fact that the political process here in the United States is full of angry voices and immobilized by large blocks of voters and politicians who are unwilling to take seriously the views of the other person with whom they disagree and to work toward compromises. And further revolutions have been rippling across the Arab world. Tyrants who ruled for decades have been toppled. Within Islam, Islam there are movements seething with anger at the West. I don't have to remind you of the forms that this anger has taken, nor of how our lives have been altered by the steps our country and other countries have taken to protect us against this anger. And whereas for a century or so, religion seemed to be in decline around the world, especially in modernized societies, now religious voices and all their diversity are full-throated and often angry. Religion has not disappeared in modernized societies. It has simply taken different forms. Now, if we understood these developments and were able to predict their emergence and outcome, we would, I suppose, feel less vulnerable. But we don't understand and can't predict. Nobody predicted the Arab uprising. No one can reliably predict the eventual outcome. <laughs> Very few people predicted the economic collapse of 2008. And it's obvious that no economist fully understands the workings of the globalized economy, or even of the American economy. So our times are not only troubled and turbulent, but unpredictable, and I would say, in some respects, many respects, inscrutable. That's the social context within which we ask the question, what is a college like Elizabethtown for? It's a context very different from the context of this country a hundred years, of, of this college a hundred years ago, and it's actually very different from the context of ten years ago. Part of what a college is for is research. But on this occasion, I want to set that off to the side, important though it is, and focus on the teaching of students. What is the goal, or what should be the goal, of the educational endeavors of Elizabethtown College? <laughs> well, every student who graduates from this college will occupy certain social roles. You, students, you will all eventually find yourself in some occupation, or so one hopes. You will all occupy the role of a citizen. Most of you will occupy the role of parent, and so forth. I submit that one of the major goals of collegiate education is to equip students for choosing and living out their future social roles. A marvelous writer on education, I think he's marvelous, even though I vigorously disagree with him on many points, is the University of Cambridge political theorist Michael Oakeshott. Oakeshott is dismissive of the goal that I just now presented. He thinks that education should not prepare students for choosing and living out their social roles, but should liberate them from their present and future, future social particularities by inducting them into humankind's cultural heritage. <laughs> well, I think Oakeshott's dismissal presupposes too pinched a view on his part of what, it is, of what it is to equip students for choosing and living out their social roles. Let me explain. In most societies, the social roles that a person occupied were simply ascribed to him or her. One had no choice. The son of a, sur the son of a serf was a serf, and that was it. We in our society not only do choose, but must choose. 
Now, one consideration that should go into that choice is whether or not one is good at the role under consideration. Another consideration that should go into it, I think, is whether one can find fulfillment in that role. For lots of students, collegiate education clarifies what they're good at, and it clarifies what they find fulfilling. But there's a third consideration that should go into choosing one's social roles, a normative or moral consideration. It's this, can you occupy that role in such a way that you can be of genuine service to your fellow human beings? Can you occupy it in such a way that you contribute significantly to their well-being, their flourishing? Can you occupy it in such a way that you honor their dignity? Can you occupy it in such a way that you advance the cause of justice? I submit that one of the fundamental goals of collegiate education is to equip students to ask and to answer that normative question or those normative questions when choosing the roles that they will occupy and then to continue asking that question as they live out the roles that they have chosen. For look, it's not enough to choose to become, take your pick, a lawyer, because one judges that one can occupy that role in such a way that one can be of genuine service to one's fellow human beings. And then, once one is in that role, to remove one's moral thinking cap and to practice law the way everybody else practices it. Each day anew, one has to ask the question, Am I living out this role in such a way that I am of genuine service to my fellow human beings and that I genuinely honor their dignity? And not infrequently, one's answer to that question will require that one not do things the way everybody else is doing them. <laughs> Distinct from this, let me call it this moral dimension of liberal arts education, but interacting with it, is another dimension. It's the one that Oakshot identifies and celebrates. Liberal arts education inducts students into the cultural heritage of the attempts of humankind to understand the world, ourselves, and God, and into the cultural heritage of the products of human creativity. Understanding whether it be of stars and galaxies, of plate tectonics, of our human biological makeup, of some stretch of history, or whatever. Understanding requires data. But understanding goes beyond data to discern something that makes sense of the data. Understanding answers our why questions. Why does this happen? Why are things like that? How did this come about? Sometimes our attempts to understand are animated by our desire to improve our lives, our own and that of our fellows. But sometimes our attempts to understand are animated instead by love, by the disinterested love of understanding, and by the disinterested love of the products of human creativity. I submit that at the core of liberal arts education is such love, where the disinterested love of understanding and the disinterested love of the products of human creativity to disappear, a fundamental dimension of liberal arts education would also have dis disappeared. Every now and then, coming to know ourselves and the world evokes in us awe at that which we have come to understand. Awe at the astounding immensity and astounding intricacy of God's creation. So too, every now and then, we are stopped in our tracks by awe at the products of human creativity by J.S. Bach's B minor mass, or I would say even more by his sonatas and partitas for solo violin. Awe. 
but also coming to know and understand the history of humankind evokes in us, every now and then, horror at what human beings have done to each other and to the world. I say this today, having been to the Holocaust Museum in Washington three weeks ago. That is horror. Awe is one of the roots of religion. Horror at what human beings have done is religion's greatest challenge. If a student in her four years at college never feels awe, I think something has gone wrong, either with the student or with her education or both. And if she never feels horror, then too something has gone wrong. Liberal arts education has a distinct moral dimension. That's the point I made when I said that liberal arts education equips students to choose and to live out their social roles. The point I'm making now is that liberal arts education also has a distinct affective and emotional dimension. It is grounded in love, disinterested love of understanding and of humankind's creativity. And when it goes well, it evokes two of the deepest of human emotions, awe and horror. Let me close by posing a question that I'm going to have to leave it to you to answer. Some of you will have heard about a new book by the sociologist Christian Smith and his associates titled Lost in Transition. It's a follow-up to a book of a year ago of Souls in Transition. The book includes interviews with 230 young adults from across the U.S. aimed at uncovering their moral lives and thought. What the interviews reveal, to put it bluntly, is that most of those interviewed, far and away most of those interviewed, were moral morons, incapable of thinking in moral terms, capable only of thinking in terms of, well, I wouldn't feel good doing that, or I would feel good doing that, which are not moral terms. In our troubled and turbulent times, the effective and emotional dimension of liberal arts education is as relevant as it ever was. I would say that the moral dimension is even more relevant and important. But the interviews Smith conducted raised raise this question. Is such an education possible? Or have I abused your time by sketching a pure fantasy? I think such an education is still possible. Very few of the students I taught across some 45 years seemed to me to be moral morons. Many of them had a disinterested love of understanding and of human creativity. Many of them experienced awe. It was my impression that most of them experienced horror. But maybe my experience was atypical. So what do you think, students, professors, staff, supporters, president of Elizabethtown College. Is liberal arts education committed to service, as I've described it, a moral enterprise motivated by love, evocative of awe and horror? Is such an education still possible here in this place and at this time, or is its day over? Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas. Carl J. Strickwerda. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees, I do declare you to be the 14th president 
of Elizabethtown College on this day, Saturday, October the 1st, 2011. Please accept this insignia of your office. Wear it with our faith in your true guidance of this college. Thank you, Jim, for your service as chair of the Board of Trustees, succeeding Dave Hostler, who served the college so well for many years. And thank you to everyone here at the college who's welcomed my wife, Gail, and me here to Elizabethtown. From the students who baked us cookies when we were unpacking, to the staff members who brought over sandwiches the week we arrived, and to the many alumni, faculty, and community members who've welcomed us with such kind hospitality over the last few months. I also want to say a special thank you to those family members and friends who've come here this weekend to celebrate a milestone in my life. My sister Laurel and her husband Ken, with their daughter, my niece, Reverend Jessica Bratt, my brother Tom and his wife Donna, my daughter Lorna, who continues to teach her parents more each passing year, my sisters and brother-in-law, brothers-in-law, Joan and Dan and Marilyn and Paul are all here. Many friends from the years which Gail and I spent at Calvin College, the University of Kansas, and the College of William and Mary are also here, and a Margaret, Ben, Peter and Donna, Claudia, Nick and Claire, Liz, Sue and Heather. Thank you all for sharing this day with us. Special thanks goes to someone very special. 40 years ago this month, a rather scruffy looking sophomore wandered into a socio sociology class at a small college in Michigan. There he met a brilliant freshman student who despite the unpromising material she had to work with, <laughs> has never given up trying to improve both his appearance and his character. <laughs> Gail, Thanks for your commitment to sharing a life together, especially through many, many trying times, and for your example of tough-mindedness, strong love, and deep faith. While this is a milestone in my life, it is, more importantly, a milestone in the life of a great institution, Elizabethtown College. This weekend celebrates the creativity and community which are at the heart of this college. On Thursday evening, 40 students presented a dazzling display of projects in which they and their faculty mentors had done original research. Fields ranging from bioengineering to creative writing, occupational therapy, sociology, literature, psychology. Last night's concert by the music faculty here and the discussions this morning by faculty on globalization and peace, justice, and conflict re resolution reminded me, along with the students, why I wanted to be president of this college. Intellectual rigor, artistic creativity, and collaborative learning make up the soul of Elizabethtown College. This inauguration and my presidency are two more steps 
in a long, inspiring journey. That journey began over 100 years ago. Elizabethtown College was created by people who possessed profound beliefs about higher education. J.G. Francis, George Falkenstein, Jesse Ziegler, and their co-workers believed two profound truths. Education should be rooted in a moral vision, and those who are educated should use that education to serve others in order to create a better world. In over a century since our founding, much has changed. In its size and complexity, Elizabethtown College has grown far beyond what our founders envisioned. From a small school in a single building on the hill over there, it's become the larger, more scholarly, comprehensive institution of today. Yet other things have not changed. The founders, profound truths of a moral vision and of service to society remain. Those truths have guided us through the immense changes we've seen. We owe a debt to our founders. We also owe a debt to those who took their vision and continue to recreate the college in order to meet new challenges. We are here today because the men and women of Elizabethtown College over the decades chose to meet challenges each time by changing the college. In the future, we will have to change still more. And seeking how Elizabethtown College will flourish into still another century, we have to look at both the enduring truths given to us by our founders and at the lessons of constant innovation that we have seen. Well, what are the challenges we face? They are, first of all, to make higher education relevant in a rapidly changing digital world. Second, to reach out to a society in need. And third, to create leaders for a global world. When information on any subject can be obtained almost instantly anywhere, why should one obtain a college degree? When society has such pressing needs, high unemployment, hard-pressed social services, why should you obtain a college degree? And do colleges serve anyone besides themselves? And finally, when the young people of today will inherit the most interconnected planet that human civilization has ever seen, how do we teach this generation to live globally? The relevance of education, human need, globalization, these are our challenges. How will we answer? What are our values and our goals? We serve. That is a simple touchstone for all that we do. How do we serve? Because we at this college have been given a special gift of learning. Our service must be deeply involved with the intellectual mission which has been entrusted to us. We serve our students and society, first of all, by pursuing excellence in everything we do. It's the pursuit of excellence that's enabled the Young Center for Anabaptist and Pietist Studies to educate Americans and others around the world, Christians and non-Christians alike, about religious history, and most recently, about the meaning of forgiveness. It's the pursuit of excellence that enables some of our faculty to win grants from the National Science Foundation, National Institutes of Health, and other agencies, and to teach their students through research. It's the pursuit of excellence that drives others of our faculty, scholars and artists, to publish, edit, translate, interpret, and to reach their students who are working alongside them. It's the pursuit of excellence that drives our students to win Goldwater, Rhodes, Truman Scholarships, entrance to graduate programs, places in medical and law school, and important positions in companies and agencies. Our teaching, our scholarship, our science, our creativity, our information technology, our student services, indeed everything that enriches and supports the sacred task of learning must strive for excellence. The success of our athletic teams 
as both tremendous competitors and great teammates demonstrates our commitment to excellence. The staff members who maintain our buildings, provide food, manage the finances, and carry out countless other tasks make this a great institution through their dedication to the highest quality and the soundest management. We should never accept less than the very best we can achieve. Excellence, hard work, discipline achievement, rigorous thinking, the push to both understand and to innovate, that is what we have done at our best and what we must continually strive for. Aiming at excellence is not about individual achievement on its own. Excellence is almost always the product of a team effort. At our best, we have made this college, the entire college, a learning environment. Athletic teams, student activities, residence halls, the offices which employ our students, as well as seminar rooms, studios, laboratories, and the library, all are part of learning. Indeed, we demonstrate at Elizabethtown College why college is so important, even in an age when information is instantly available. Education here must not be about passing on information. Education at Elizabethtown College must be about learning to excel together. Here, individuals develop their talents the most that they can through working with others and for the purpose of serving others. Our motto, Educate for Service, captures the collaborative and purposeful pursuit of excellence that higher education everywhere so desperately needs. In the future, in order to keep and make higher education even more relevant in a digital, digital age, we will make education here even more focused on collaborative learning around research, on learning all across the campus, and on an engagement with society. If we can strive and achieve giving every Elizabethtown College student an internship or service learning experience, one that is both intellectually rigorous and deeply engaged in practice, and give every student the experience of collaborative research, we will serve our society well. We serve. And in serving, we lead. Service is not about taking a back seat or being self-effacing for its own sake. Serving others can mean being a leader. If one comes to leadership through service, one leads not by seeking power, but by employing one's talents to help others lead the best lives that they can. Leadership that comes from service means that one is a servant leader. Elizabethtown College has long trained leaders who've served. Hart Hartmut von Hentig, a veteran of the German Army, came here as an international student after the Second World War and graduated in 1950. Here he became deeply influenced by our teaching on peacemaking and service. He went on to become an educational reformer in Germany and a leading voice at the University of Bielefeld, one of the country's most innovative universities. Laura Skantz, a continuing education graduate from 2006, has worked in the insurance industry for many years, run her own consulting firm, and is now chief operating officer of Horizon Initiative, dedicated to building schools and businesses in poor countries. Her organization's work in Kenya is a model for economic development. Paul Weaver, class of 1968, became vice chairman of Price Waterhouse Coopers and is now chairman of the Statue of Liberty Ellis Island Foundation, helping to preserve these landmarks of American history. As Weaver has said, in this nation, almost anyone can achieve great things. This is a gift of incredible opportunity, one that we should first appreciate and respond by giving back. 
In the paths trod by these graduates and countless others, we at Elizabethtown College can rededicate ourselves to meeting the challenges facing our world. We can meet these challenges both by the education we offer and the service we do. The United States was once the world leader in the percentage of young people completing college. Now we are 14th. The challenge is not access to college, but students completing degrees. Meanwhile, businesses need skills and skilled workers. Elizabethtown College leads in meeting these challenges. At few private colleges, is it true that 40% of the students are first-generation college students? In this year's entering class, 50% are first-generation. We offer employment to over 60% of our students here on campus to help them graduate. Over 80% of our first-year students graduate from college, which puts us among the top level in the nation. The college not only teaches our students to serve, we model how to serve. In our continuing education program, almost 700 working adults are studying to complete their degrees. We sponsor the music at Gretna Festival and the Wheatland Chorale and enrich the arts for our community. The High Center for Family Business advises family firms across our region. Elizabethtown College leads through the education we give and the service we offer. In leading, in serving and leading, we inspire. Elizabethtown College has tremendous power to influence the world. We have done so in the past, we are doing it now, and we have much greater heights to reach. Challenged by gifted faculty to take on large tasks, our graduates have influenced the world. Charles Coates Walker, class of 1941, was a staff member of the American Friends Service Committee when it won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1947. He arranged for one of the leading theorists of nonviolence, A.J. Musty, to speak at the seminary where Martin Luther King Jr. was studying and later worked alongside King in the civil rights movement. Ernest Lefebvre, class of 42, helped rehabilitate German POWs after World War II, advised the U.S. government on counterterrorism and peacekeeping, and founded the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, D.C. Judy Ware, class of 68, and her husband Paul have helped educate thousands at the college and in our region by creating the Ware Colloquium on Global Citizenship and Peacemaking, which has brought Nobel Peace Prize winners Jody Williams, F.W. de Klerk, and Shirin Abadi here to speak. As that great American philosopher, Will Rogers, put it, war won't stop until there is as much brains and scientific study put to aid peace as there is to promote war. Thanks to the work of many people associated with Elizabethtown College, we study and teach here how to build a more peaceful world. These stories teach us much. Elizabethtown College must both hold to the best of the past and it must move forward. We serve, first of all, by doing best what we are best suited for, promoting learning and academic excellence. As we move into the future, our faculty must be equipped to carry out research and scholarship as fully as possible so that they can bring their students along on the voyage of creative discovery. We must recreate college education in order that service learning, internships, learning through research are the hallmarks of an Elizabethtown experience. As a teacher, I have loved guiding my students through research projects, watching them struggle through the difficult process of testing hypotheses, slogging through reams of information, and finally seeing insights arise in their minds has been as rich a reward as any teacher could ever have. If I had any, needed any validation of why I am proud to become the president of Elizabethtown College, 
the students who I met at the research symposium Thursday night would have provided it. They inspired me. I want all of our students here to have that same experience. Elizabethtown College has also served and we have led by making an impact on the world. We have long had international students here and taught our students to engage with a global world. Now the challenge is to weave internationalization into the very core of Elizabethtown College. I know firsthand that studying abroad and gaining an understanding of the complex global world we live in can be a life-changing experience for students. My career has been dedicated to providing those life-changing experiences. Elizabethtown College must, I believe, expand our study of foreign languages and our students' participation in study abroad. As much as possible, we want to make study abroad focused on faculty student research and on service learning. Our international business program with its emphasis on foreign language study and internships and our relationship to our study abroad consortium, BCA, with international programs focused on peace and social justice, point us in the direction we should go. We must also explore creating joint degree programs with international institutions. We need to help all of our students to become a bigger part of the world. We want to equip them as best we possibly can to help make this be a better world. To inspire others, finally, we will need to become even more conscious of our college as a moral community. As our founders knew well, the goal of education is not knowledge, skills, new experiences, or even employment, as important as those all are. The goal of a college education is to use one's talents for good to make this a better world. For a society that too often seems morally adrift, our students who are taught to see the ethical dimensions of all the domains we study are a precious asset. The Called to Lead program, which helps over 300 Elizabethtown College students discern how they should live, is a model for higher education. Over the last nine months since I accepted this position here as president, I've been struck by how many times the alumni I meet have been asked by the businesses in which they work to take leadership positions, to be responsible for training new employees, or to help set ethical policies by their firms and their coworkers. Our alumni live out our founders' moral vision. Elizabethtown College has inspired its alumni to do great things, to influence the world around them in powerful ways. We must rededicate ourselves to making service through moral leadership one of the most important ways we inspire our students and our alumni. We have a rich history. We educate to serve. Education as it be at its best is rooted in a moral vision. Despite the economic challenges we face and which American society faces, we have great resources here in the dedication of this college community to excellence in all things. Together, students, staff members, faculty, alumni, and all supporters of Elizabethtown College, we can do great things. Thanks to your support, your dedication, your shared vision, I can take on this new task with pride. Thanks to your support, dedication, and shared vision, I look forward to the future with confidence. Together, we can serve, lead, and inspire. Thank you very much.
And now the benediction. Spirit of God, beyond all things, yet within and among us. As we prepare to leave this place, we ask that you inspire each one of us with vision, hope, and courage, that we may lead with creative thought and serve our local communities and the world beyond with innovative action. Send us forth from this place with your divine blessing that we may treat all living creatures with reverence, that we may journey with eyes wide open to the miracles unfolding before us each day. In the name of all that is holy, amen.